I have a long association with ICPSR. I first came here in 1976 as a graduate student. And 1980, I taught my first course here. Um, in fact, well, I won't say anything to Doug about that. <laughs> but Doug was an early student in that seminar. Yes, yes. All right, so let's uh, let's get on to the main topic here and what longitudinal model should I choose? This is just an overview of what I'll cover. I'll have a little bit of an introduction. Then I'm gonna have a brief discussion of common theoretical patterns and observations people make across a number of different social and behavioral type phenomena that we study outcomes. And I'm characterizing these by a series of terms. I'll go into more um, depth as I cover each of these models. And then I'll do an extended empirical example to illustrate how we can estimate these different models and get some empirical information that may help us to choose among them. I also want to um, point out that these slides were prepared in collaboration with Ilya Gudin, who was a co-author on that paper, which is the empirical example that I'll be going over. First of all, um, you know, I've been around in the career long enough to remember when people were sort of longing to have some longitudinal data, you know, that they could analyze and large surveys and the rest of it. Well, our prayers have been answered. You know, we have so many data sets now that are available, some just generated here, some generated from my home institute, and lots of others generated around the world. So we have now much better situation with having this longitudinal data that's giving us capabilities that we didn't have before when we were relying on the cross-sectional data. And this does raise the question as to how should we analyze it? You know, what type of model should we use for studying the outcome of interest to us? Now, I know what people will say, well, just do what theory tells you to do. Use the model suggested by theory or substantive consideration. And I fully agree with that. But the problem is theory is rarely that specific to say, use this model. This is the pattern of change you're going to observe. So I think when I hear that type of advice, I'd love to just ask the follow-up question, okay, what does theory say in this particular area? Fill in the blank that's going to dictate a particular model. Um, so the fact is we're kind of on our own. If we have this longitudinal data and we want to use a longitudinal model to determine it. The end result is we have customs in different disciplines, right? So if you're coming from uh, economics, uh, political science, to some degree sociology, you're more likely to be using a fixed effects model or choosing between a fixed effect and a random effect. Uh, in psychology, it's done a little bit less frequently in that way. It's more growth curves are very popular or autoregressive type models. So what you're really looking at are customs of these different groups determining what model we're using. Now, we all want to do good science. That does not sound like good science to me, you know, just to be following what other people have done with this particular data set or what the hot technique is for a particular individual. So what's the cost of doing this, of using the wrong model? Well, you know, if you think of science as having several different functions, description, explanation, prediction, maybe studying whether an intervention will do, all of those things can be thrown out the window if we're using the wrong model. So it really has a strong effect on trying to do scientific research in a wide variety of fields. As I said, theory in most fields is insufficiently developed. It rarely prescribes a particular longitudinal model. 
subject matter expertise, you know, if you talk to someone working in that area that you're studying, you might get some rough ideas out of that person. Um, but uh, any of you out there who do statistical consulting, you probably have had this experience where people will say, I've got this longitudinal data set. What longitudinal model should I use? As if it's a statistical question. You know, it's really, to some degree, should be involving some substantive expertise. Lacking that substantive expertise, it does turn into, or we turn back to, um, possible statistical means to help us in judging what might be best. Now, this subject matter expertise, I've um, identified some common ideas that I've seen in different substantive areas that I've worked, and I suspect that others of you have seen these ideas there too. You know, I hesitate to call these theories, they're sort of rough ideas of kind of patterns of changes that might be observed from people who have studied a particular outcome for a long time. Um, I'm labeling this the idiosyncratic context, which is sort of erratic changes, so there's not a systematic pattern, the enduring influence, lagged effects, life course changes, and then combinations of these. So what I want to do next is describe each of these patterns and then propose a model that is capturing some of those ideas on these patterns. The first one, which I'm labeling as idiosyncratic context, right? This is driven by the idea that people are behaving in particular contexts. These contexts depend on other people, as well as the person, places, the broader social environment, and these contexts can affect the outcome that you're studying. Now, to the degree we don't have, we have these contexts constantly changing, this creates a lot of instability in the outcomes we're looking at, and it makes the patterns less systematic. Another way of viewing this is saying that there's no systematic change over time in these variables. Well, how can we capture that? Well, here's one representation. Let's look at ZIT as the, the outcome variable Z for the ith individual at the teeth time period. And so what this is saying is that ZIT is equal to alpha T, which might be just a mean value across all the individuals at a particular point in time, plus a error term, the epsilon sub IT. Below that equation is the very uh, you know, crude path diagram, representing it for five waves of data. In path diagrams, boxes represent the observed variable. And so we have the Z1 through Z5, these are the observed outcome, longitudinal measures over time. And the epsilon or the error term is not enclosed in anything. And in essence, it's saying there's no systematic pattern here to study, and so you're not going to find much. The second idea that recurs in the literature, we've labeled as enduring influence. And this is suggesting that in that outcome you're looking at, if you look at an individual over time, for many individuals, you'll find some stability in that level, not perfect stability but kind of an um, unchanging aspect to it. You know, whether it's happiness, depression, anxiety, or perceived health, the example I'll be talking about. And this stability has its origins in relatively constant, let's say, personality characteristics, or it could be genetics, could be the reference groups that are stable. Just as an illustration for the empirical example I'll be looking at, it may be that people view their self, a person might view themselves as a healthy person, not because their health is always perfect over time, but they have as a reference group people in their same cohort. And they may just think, well, gee, relative to other people, I see myself in pretty healthy condition. And no matter whether you ask this question when they're 21 or 
51 or 61, they may give a relatively stable answer to that. A little bit of bouncing around because of random um, additional factors that are coming into play. This is one model that we can use to represent that type of idea. There's equivalent information with the equation and the path diagram. So let me first describe the equation. ZIT, just a reminder, this is the outcome variable for the ith individual at the teeth time period. Alpha T is allowing for there to be a average value at each time period that can change. And the Xi sub I, that is that constant enduring effect that's going to influence the response the person gives at each wave of the data. So it's always underlying the response the individual gives. It is not perfectly stable, and that instability is represented by that epsilon IT. This is an error term that varies across individuals and varies across time, which gives a little bit of bouncing around of what that value will be for the outcome variable. Now, the equivalent model is in the path diagram below, and in path diagrams, the circle or the ellipse represents the latent variable. So this is that constant enduring effect, and it's influencing with the same impact the outcome response over these five waves of data for this example. Those of you who are familiar with um, confirmatory factor analysis will recognize that this looks like a confirmatory factor analysis model, single factor with five indicators, but the five indicators are the same variable over time being influenced by that underlying enduring effect. Another idea that's very common in many areas are lagged effects. So that a variable's current value depends on its previous or lagged value. So your income last year is likely to be a darn good predictor of your income this year, or your smoking behavior last week is going to be a good predictor of how much you smoke this week, or the self-rated health example. Your self-rated health today is a function of yesterday's self-rated health. So there is a bit of inertia in variables where past values do a good job of predicting the current values of the variable. That idea we can capture in this equation and this path diagram. Um, you'll recognize this if you've dealt with autoregressive models as an AR1 process. Of course, you could complicate it more, but I'm just keeping it simple here. We have the outcome variable, ZIT, is a function of this time-specific intercept that can change over time, but it's the same for each person. An autoregressive coefficient, which is written as rho sub t, t minus one, and then zi, t minus one. So that's just the outcome variable at the prior time period. And there still, of course, is a error term capturing idiosyncratic influences. Path diagram of this is pretty simple. Z1 causes Z2, three, uh, Z2 to three, three to four, four to five. Now, there's another perspective uh, in the literature, sometimes called the life course perspective, where it suggests that there's common patterns of aging for individuals. There's life events that occur to nearly everyone, often at similar stages in life. This could be graduating from uh, elementary to middle school, high school to college, it could be work transitions like the first job, uh, promotion, retirements, or it could be family formation, like getting married or having the first birth in the family. These life events affect the social and behavioral variables that we're studying. There are likely to be common patterns, broadly speaking, but there is individual variability. So you're allowing the individuals that have these rough stages, but you're not expecting everyone 
to have the same stage at the same time, the same intercept, the same rate of change in that outcome variable. Now, this is a way to capture some of those ideas on life course perspective. This is a linear growth curve model, a common model in uh, several disciplines, where ZIT is a function of alpha I. Now, notice the other alphas we had were alpha Ts. The alpha Ts were constant across individuals at a particular time period, but allowed to change over time. This alpha I is letting each person in the sample have a different intercept for this trajectory over time plus lambda t. Lambda t is nothing more than a time trend variable. So it, if you think there's a linear trend, this lambda t would go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for equally spaced data. The beta i is a slope. This is the rate of change in the outcome for the ith individual. So it's allowing each person to have a different slope. Plus epsilon i t, epsilon i t is once again that disturbance term or that error term. Now, um, this equation or something with slightly different symbols, if you've dealt with longitudinal data, you probably have come across something like that. What you may not be familiar with unless you're dealing with uh, structural equation models is the path diagram representation of it. But that path diagram is the same as that equation. The alpha is treated as a latent random variable. The random intercepts are a latent random variable. And the slopes, the random slopes that differ across individuals, that also is a latent variable that we can't directly observe. And those two variables, the random intercept and the random slope, are influencing the repeated measures over time, the Z1 through Z5. This too looks like a factor analysis, except it's a weird factor analysis in that the factor loadings are pre prescribed by the equation. The alpha always has an influence of one. If you take a look at that ZIT equation equal alpha I, implicit is a one in front of that. And that's for every wave of the data. The beta, that um, has its coefficient being lambda t, which is the time trend variable. That's why you see the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 on those factor loadings from the beta to the repeated measure. So they're equivalent. If you're from the SEM tradition, you've probably seen this path diagram 100 times. If you're not, you've probably seen that equation or a similar equation with slight change of symbols quite frequently. But they're equivalent. Now, suppose you think that there's a nonlinear trajectory over time, so that there's actually a quadratic relationship with time in the outcome you're tracing. So we're allowing each person to have a different intercept, a different linear slope, and a different quadratic slope. The equation at the top of this slide is capturing this quadratic growth curve. Uh, it's the lambda t and lambda t squared. That's where the quadratic is coming into play. And the beta sub 2i, that is allowing each individual to have a different quadratic term. So if you're taking this life course perspective and you think there is this non-linear pattern, this is one way to attempt to capture that non-linear pattern. There's another way that you can do this. Um, this is most common in a structural equation modeling approach less common with other approaches to growth curves. It takes advantage of the fact when you look at that picture, that's a picture of a, of a factor analysis. And so if it's a factor analysis, why don't we estimate some of those lambda t's? Rather than assuming it's going 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, why don't we come up with the estimates of those factor loadings that give the optimal fit, the optimal description of the data? So this is... Uh, sometimes called a freed loading growth curve model. And it gives us a little bit more flexibility on the shape of the curve to capture how things may be changing over time. Now, the last class of model are what I'm going to call hybrid models. I would say that, to me at least, those preceding longitudinal patterns that we talked about 
perhaps with the exception that it's totally idiosyncratic. I, I don't see that occurring much. Usually there's some pattern in the longitudinal outcomes I look at. Um, they have some intuitive appeal. There's no reason to think that more than one of these processes may be operating at the same time. So these hybrid models are putting together combinations of those other models that I just have described. One example is one that a colleague and I developed some time ago. My goodness, it's approaching 20 years now. But the autoregressive latent trajectory model, what it does, it combines this idea of lagged effects influencing the current value of the repeated measures of these outcomes that you're observing over time with the life course type growth curve idea that you have each person with an individual alpha I or an intercept term and an individual slope term. So both of those things may be going on at the same time. This is what the equation and the corresponding path diagram look like when you combine them. Notice we've got that alpha, which is the random uh, intercept term. We have the random slope term beta. And then we have this Z1, which is the first wave of the data, of whatever outcome you're looking at, influencing Z2, influencing Z3, Z4, Z5. So both these things are going on at once. In that um, 2004 paper, we found a nice empirical example uh, that we put together that made intuitive sense to me. We looked at um, income. And what we found is that this model with all these terms was far better fit than an autoregressive only model or a growth curve model for predicting income. So it allowed each person to have this individualized alpha I term an individualized beta I term, but in addition, a predictor of their current income, even after you remove that growth curve aspect, a good predictor of their current income was what they made the last time, the last year. Now, a, uh, another colleague and I, Silvia Bianconcini, uh, an Italian statistician, we generalized this alt model to what we call the latent variable alt model. And by generalizing this to this latent variable form of it, we are able to have as special cases of this model, what uh, many people refer to as the fixed and random effects models, would be a special case where we can just set some parameters to zero and we can get that. Latent growth curve models, latent change score models, autoregressive and cross lag models, and then there's another paper um, I did with another colleague on uh, generalizing the fixed and random effects models with autoregressive. That also is a special case of this latent variable um, alt model. Here's the path diagram of it. And what you'll notice, um, or let me help uh, with explaining, the circles, once again, are latent variables. We've already talked about the random intercept term, alpha i, and the random slope term, beta i, being latent variables. But what this is allowing for is measurement error in your repeated measures. Now, with most of the data we deal with, we know there's measurement error in those outcomes. So what this is allowing you to do is to control for the measurement error. The symbol here is uh, for the repeated measures, the actual observed data in the data set are yi1 through yi5. The eta i1 through eta i5, that's the corresponding latent variable that underlies that indicator. So if you could remove the measurement error, you would have eta left behind. And this is a simplification. This model allows for multiple indicators of those latent variables rather than just the single indicator that I have here. So given this as background, what kind of strategy could we use for model selection? Well, I see you know, three different cases. Does theory dictate a specific model? Well, if that's the case, congratulations. You're one of the lucky few. 
Uh, but second, fit the model, and then you could fit the latent variable alt model and see if there's any additional terms that were not suggested by the theory that are improving the description of the data and make you perhaps rethink it. Or if you find out that these additional terms aren't needed, it just reinforces your choice of that particular model. Are there different longitudinal models in the literature for the same outcome? Now, this is a little surprising, but we certainly found this on the self-rated health. And we found several different models, sometimes even analyzing the same data set for the same time period, without much attention to why'd you choose that model? Or what about these other studies that used a different model? Well, what you can do in this case, if there's several different longitudinal models, you can compare the fit to each other and then compare the fit to the latent variable all model. And this is a way to use that empirical evidence to gain a little bit more information on what might be the best longitudinal model for your data. And perhaps the most common situation, maybe I'm too cynical, but no models really suggest it, seriously suggest it. I don't, by suggested, I don't mean citing somebody else who used this you know, fixed effect model, who probably cited somebody else who did it, and the other person did it for no good reason, probably. So if there's no model suggested, you could fit the latent variable alt model and look for non-significant terms as a way of simplifying the model structure. Now, this is the empirical example where I wanted to illustrate some of these ideas. This is taken from um, Bowen and Guten 2021 demography article. And we looked at self-rated health. Uh, self-rated health is widely used in a variety of disciplines. It's easy to collect, parsimonious. It seems to have pretty good predictive validity for uh, future health and mortality. And it's one of the few consistently available longitudinal measures out there. If you look at the literature that's analyzing this measure, you can find autoregressive, fixed and random effects, growth curves. You know, there's really no systematic comparison of which model is best for that. Plus, there's no correction for measurement error, despite what appears to be the limited reliability of that question, as well as many of the other variables that we're using in analyses. So let's go over those questions. Does theory dictate a specific model? Not that we've seen. Are there different longitudinal models in the literature for the same outcome? This is a table from uh, the paper. And you know we've got several of the different there, autoregressive, random effects models, quadratic version, linear, quadratic, et cetera. So yeah, definitely more. Is a model suggested explicitly? No, implicitly maybe, you know, by some of the ideas on this. So let's see what this looks like. We analyzed two data sets, the National Longitudinal Study of Youth and the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health or Ad Health. So how do we compare this? Well, first we estimated models corresponding to this enduring lagged effect life course and the hybrid perspective. And we compared nested models based on chi-square tests, uh, BIC differences, and measures of overall fit like the CF uh, compared to fit index, Tucker-Lewis index, and one minus the root mean squared error of approximation. Now, if you're not in SEM, um, these last three probably has not much meaning to you, but the CFI, TLI, and one minus RMSEA, the closer to one, the better the fit. The further below one, the worse the fit. Um, for the BIC, I use this in a way that's different than the way um, most people do in, in SEM literature, where it's uh, scored so that the more negative the value is, the better the fit, and the more positive it is, the worse the fit. And we were able to build a single indicator latent variable model for subjective health. So what I'm I'm um, hiding a lot of the gory details right now, but what we do is we treat the self-rated health as an ordinal variable, and because it's repeated measures, we're able to actually estimate the amount of measurement error in that single indicator 
by constraining error variances uh, equal for just a couple of waves. That's enough to identify it, enough to give us good estimates. So we're controlling for ordinality, measurement error um, in that repeated measure when we do these examinations. Here's the enduring influence one, just to remind you. So this is saying, we got the self-reported health. People have kind of a constant view of their health, and this is just going to drive the response each time along with a random error. This is the autoregressive. This is just saying, I give you my response to self-reported health or self-rated health. Today, it's driven by what I was thinking and said yesterday. You know, it's kind of a first order autoregressive. The growth curve one is saying each person has a different trajectory of how they view their health, their self-reported health, you know, controlling for the measurement error. So they have a different starting point and they have a different slope. And that's what's characterizing the trend. We're allowing for a quadratic form of that just in case there's a nonlinearity. You know, perhaps at later stages in life, it changes in some way. This is the free loading one, which gives a little bit more flexibility on the nature of that curve. And here's a table to summarize the comparison of these non-hybrid models that are here. Now that first column, uh, or actually the second column, the chi-square, first column gives the name of the model we tested. Second column is the chi-square. With this chi-square, the higher the value, the worse the fit. The degrees of freedom correspond to that chi-square, the BIC, remember, the bigger positive values, the worse the fit, the larger negative values, the better the fit. The CFI, Tucker-Lewis Index, 1 minus RMSEA, we're looking for ones the closer to 1, the better their fit. And in this table, if we were forced to just choose non-hybrid models, one of the simplest models, the autoregressive, seems to have the best fit. Just saying self-reported health, Current times predicted by the prior time, rather than getting these more complex growth curves and you know the rest of it. But that's not the whole story. Here are the hybrid models. So this is the latent variable alt model where we allow that nonlinearity that we could get with that freed loading growth curve model. Then we have the latent variable alt with linear growth structure. And then we have the latent variable alt with a quadratic growth curve structure. And um, what you can see is that all of these have better fit than any of the regular standard models that we examined there. But we found that the uh, latent variable alt model um, with linear growth, we found that that slope term, it has both an intercept and a slope term. That slope term was essentially zero with zero variance. So we didn't need it. So we found that if we went to the simplification of the latent variable alt model with the intercept only, we ended up with the best fitting model of the batch. Here's a picture of what that model's like. It's a little bit, the way I kind of viewed this, well, let me, let me explain it first before I talk about how I'm viewing it. All right, the ellipses are the latent variables. So L1, L2, L3, L4, L, all, all the way up to 17 waves, L17. That is self-reported health controlling for the measurement error in the survey response that we're analyzing. So it's having that relationship controlling for a measurement error in it. Z1, Z2, Z3, up to Z17, that's what actually is in the data set. But we're controlling for the measurement error in there so that we can see what the relationship is between uh, self-reported health controlling for measurement error. That alpha, that's almost like that enduring effect aspect of it. So it's, it's almost like, here's what's going on with a person's report of uh, health. First of all, there is this kind of enduring aspect. The person generally considers him or herself or um, you know, whatever, a healthy person. And that's driving the response that they're giving at each time you ask them. But that's not the whole story, because what also is happening, same time they have that going on, what they characterized their health to be the last time also was driving 
So for example, suppose that they had some kind of accident where they injured themselves in some way. Well, maybe that affected that L2 response. So generally, right, this person has this view, they're really healthy, but they can't ignore the fact that they've injured their leg and it's hurting or you know whatever. That's going to change the response the next time. So the response, each one of these responses is influenced by both this tendency to give the same stable response, but also by the history, you know, the immediate history of what occurred beforehand. Uh, so pri prior subjective health has a strong impact on current. So the autoregressive coefficient is about 0.85 here. Uh, we also, as a byproduct of this analysis, we can give you a reliability estimate of that self-rated health, and it's about 0.6. And it doesn't vary much over time. The reliability is around 0.6. Uh, the model structure explains a lot of the variation in subjective health, about 90%. So these are R squares of about 0.9 in explaining how much variance in self-reported health we're getting. The other thing that we both found, uh, this is Ilya and I, both found surprising, is we looked at if there were systematic differences across um, males and females um, and different race ethnic groups, and we found that the same model worked there and there wasn't you know, really noticeable differences in the parameter estimates. We weren't expecting that. Now, add health. Obviously, we did model fitting, you know, a fair amount of model fitting uh, there. And it's always um, uh, helpful to look at another data set to see what that reveals. So we looked at add health. There are lots of differences in the data sets between the National Longitudinal Study of Youth and add health. Add health has five versus 17 waves that we just analyzed. The spacing in ad health is not even, but we did do the same kind of examination and we ended up with the latent variable alt intercept only having an excellent fit with few estimation issues. So we found a pretty good replication on that ad, ad health data set. I've left out a lot of the details that are in this uh, Bowen and Guten paper. Um, So, how would I summarize this? Theories really do not dictate specific longitudinal models. If there's somebody who can give me some good examples, I would love to see it, where a theory tells us a specific longitudinal model. There might be some things in learning theory, you know, in education, uh, where that might be occurring, but so many of the other outcomes that are out there, I just don't see it. There are, however, common ideas, common patterns that have been suggested for many outcomes. We talked about this enduring effect, the lagged effects, life course trajectories. And this latent variable alt model permits these patterns alone or in combinations, in hybrids, and it's, it provides us an empirical means to try to discriminate between them. You know, after all, if we don't have the substantive guidance, we're kind of forced to rely on this empirical information. Uh, to see what it can tell us. Um, so what I did with the self-rated health, you could take that same approach with um, a large number of other outcomes, you know, just to see what is the best fit, best fitting model, and perhaps empirically most appropriate for your data. Now, why should we do that? Because I, I think our current situation is not great. I think we probably have lots of incorrect models out there we're using, poor descriptions of temporal processes, false estimates of causal effects. You know, if we don't have the right model, we don't know what that's doing to our estimates of the causal impact of one variable um, on another. And it's not like this is impossible stuff to do. You know, so what I'm saying is that we this is easily doable. Software's out there, don't we need to invent new software for it? So we can compare and test different longitudinal models. Uh, those are some of the references from this. I also wanted to show you that the program's not that bad. This is the program for the latent variable um, uh, intercept only, the final model we had. 
This is a Levon program, an R program that does structural equation models. This first one's basically reading in the data and saying what estimator we're going to use. Yeah. What? Oh, this is M plus. You're right. I'm sorry. We did it in both, but this is M plus. Thanks, Doug. I say he learned a lot from that class he took with me, but M plus didn't exist then. So, <laughs> and this is the model statement, you know, to to get the results. So you can see it's not terribly difficult, you know, to implement. This is the um, equation form of the latent variable alt model. So. Um, just to tell you the ingredients here. So that left-hand side, that's an eta IT. That's the latent variable version of your repeated outcome. That's equal to alpha I. So this is a person-specific term, allows a person to differ on that. Lambda 2T, this is a matrix, I mean, a, a scalar factor loading that varies over time for this beta I. The row term, the row T, T minus one, uh, alpha I, T minus one, that's the autoregressive term. Um, I didn't talk about it in the example I gave you, but we also allow you to have a variety of observed covariates in there, influencing that latent variable as well. Uh, the stuff below here, the other three equations, uh, the YIT has to do with the measurement model. You could use multiple indicators if you wanted there. The alpha I and the beta I, these are equations if you wanted to predict what's determining that alpha I and the beta I. This just the path diagram we had earlier. There's another form of this LV alt model. Um, but let me get to show, let's see. All right, so this is just an illustration. The top of this slide has the general latent variable alt model. The question is, all right, how do we get to the growth curve model from this latent variable alt model? Well, if you set the um, rho t, t minus one to zero, you set the lambda two t in that top equation, the top of the slide to t minus one, you end up with a linear latent growth curve. Let's look at another one. Here's classic fixed and random effects models. I know this looks quite different than what you might see in a lot of the treatments of fixed and random effects models, but uh, believe me, these things will be equivalent. How can we get from the latent variable alt model to a fixed and random effects panel model? Well, first of all, get rid of that autoregressive term, set rho t, t minus one equal to zero. Set that slope term, that beta i to zero. And set the eta i t just equal to um, alpha i plus gamma t alpha, uh, x i t plus zeta. And if you want the fixed effect model, you allow alpha i and xit to correlate. If you want the random effects model, you force them to be uncorrelated. So what this means is that by testing those parameters, you know, estimating this latent variable alt model, you think you have the fixed effects? Fine. Use the latent variable alt model, set the row, see if the row is significantly different from zero, if beta i is significantly different from zero. If they are not significantly different from zero, that's consistent with either the fixed or random effects model. So you can literally just test for that. Um, in this paper, um, this 2018 paper, we show how you can get special cases of this latent variable alt, random and fixed effects, quadratic growth curve, freed loading, quasi-simplex models, latent dual chain score models, um, et cetera. So I would be happy to um, entertain any questions on that material. I hope I didn't go too fast on that. Well, I'll, I'll like to start us actually, because I think there's one that came in through the Q&A that would be uh, pick up right where, where you were maybe a, a moment ago, a few slides ago. Um, maybe just talk us through uh, as best you could another example application. So the, uh, this participant is interested in um, I believe in relating political trust to health expenditure at the national level. So it has country year data uh, and is looking to uh, relate political trust to health expenditures. And how might they uh, how might they implement that in this uh, in this framework? Yeah, what all right. 
Practically speaking, what I probably would do is I would start by modeling each of those outcome variables. So political trust first, try to determine what my best fitting um, longitudinal model is for that. And then for health expenditures, do the same thing. Then with those as input, I would try to bring them both together based on what my hypotheses are. You know, on my hypotheses that it is at the political trust at a particular time period is influencing health expenditures at that particular time period or vice versa. Or suppose we got ended up with those alpha eyes and beta eyes in the model. Do we think those alpha eyes for political trust are related to the alpha eyes for the health expenditures? Or do we see there's so many possibilities there and it's not a statistical question, it's a subject matter question of what do you think is the most feasible as to what's occurring? You know, if you think there's a real long-term process that's occurring, you know, maybe it is the alpha eyes and beta eyes for those two different series that are influencing each other's and the actual time-specific ones don't matter that much. Alternatively, if you think this is really temporally sensitive, and if you shift the health expenditures, that's going to have a big impact on political trust right away. Then it, the model is going right there. But it's like doing what I said, but then putting the two models together. And so the participants should feel free to follow up as well. And you can take your own questions from the live audience. They don't seem that alive. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine circumstances under which, and I can't think of any, but under which the model that you select, the choice, would be affected by uh, the use of different covariates? And, and just to make it simple, let's forget about time varying covariates. Let's, let's imagine we're thinking of covariates that just represent antecedent conditions for Florida. You know, at the, at, at the beginning of the time period, so to speak. Yeah, I think that would be possible. You know, to the degree those covariates are correlated with some of the other terms that are in that expression. Okay. I mean, that's why I was saying, practically speaking, and answering that other question, because, yeah, your choice of the models theoretically could be influenced by you doing the modeling separately, you know, if they're influencing each other, um, but there's not like a clean alternative to that, it just would get so messy to, to do it. You know, in an ideal world, we would figure out what's the best pattern of growth that we can get for each of these series. And then you as the researcher could just say, oh, they have th thoroughly studied this. And it's a, you know, growth curve model that is the best model for these data. So that's gonna be my starting point, you know, and just take it from there, but we don't have that. So we have another question. Um, well, first two uh, uh, technical ones. Um, uh, someone would like you to uh, put the uh, references slide back up on the screen. Uh, and uh, a second person asks uh, if you would uh, share, if you mind uh, sharing the PDF uh, with our audience of your presentation, no, uh, you can no. let us know that offline. But I'll get to a real question about the, the uh, modeling approach and strategy here. Um, so this question is, uh, if we're truly uncertain about model specification and have many plausible options, why not use a Bayesian model averaging to update our po posterior belief about the right model based on the data? Information from the theory can be incorporated into prior beliefs assigned to each candidate model. And we don't run as great a risk of overfitting or p-hacking by estimating an omnibus model with many parameters and allowing each of those parameters uh, perhaps to have a false positive rate. Yeah, I would ask that person to look at what the typical Bayesian model averaging is doing. And it's usually using extremely simplified models. It's not gonna consider models like this if, if you consider models like this, I think this would be a great strategy. But the most common applications I've seen of it have been, do I need these covariates you know, in there where everything's observed, everything's perfectly measured. I've got nice normal prior distributions on all my coefficients. I mean, that's a sweet world if it exists, but um, 
So if you generalize it beyond the way it's usually applied and be, beyond the just saying, I'm going to choose these observed covariates, I'm going to ignore the measurement area in them. If you do stuff like this, it'd be great. It provide more information, but if this isn't even on the radar, how is the Bayesian modeling averaging going to pull in an alpha i, or you know the beta i, these latent variables that are there? Again, the uh, participant can uh, continue the discussion. It's somewhat clunky to do this through myself as the intermediary, but I'm happy to keep in entertaining questions. Um, so another one. Yeah. There we go, live audience. Um, I, I think this is a, you know, a great way, uh, especially if it's not a truly really statistical uh, longitudinal model. One of the issues that I've come across with other data sets is, is missing data uh, is efficient um, and we're dropping out of uh, some sense of the dropping out of right. computation, uh, random multiple learning. How do you suggest? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there is, uh, under the same assumption of uh, multiple imputation, uh, missing at random R, there is a maximum likelihood approach that's built into Lebon, M plus, most of the SEM programs, where you don't have to impute any data and you can just estimate using all of the variables and data that are available in your data set. Now, of course, if the MAR assumption, it's, if it's missing, not at random, you, you have that issue, um, and that'll affect this maximum likelihood approach as well as uh, multi-amputation. We have another practical question, wondering if there's R code or, uh, or Stata um, uh, in, in the future for implementing these um, or, or presently for implementing your LVA, LT, I mean. Yeah, we did do this in Levon, and I happened to just grab the the M plus output when I was um, doing this. But and Levon is an R package. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, Levon's the R package for SEM. Very nice uh, R package for for SEM. Well, I'll ask a question because I have one as well. Um, Going back to your answer about the, uh, thinking about the relationship between um, just to continue using it as an example between um, uh, health expenditures and uh, I think it was political trust. Yes. Um, so my uh, in a previous life, I did some time series for a while uh, and and I, I left time series um, and now do spatial temporal uh, analysis, but um, the one impression I had is I was worried about the prospect of uh, what time series analysts used to call pre-whitening their data. Mm. So first you yeah. would, you yeah. would, you know, clean away all the temporal dependencies, and then you would see whether these two variables were related. And, uh, and, and you see where I'm going already. I'm quite worried that, well, you just took away the relationship between these variables. What are you talking about? Uh, so I'm a little bit concerned that the uh, that if we take each variable uh, as uh, as having been generated right, right via uh, uh, errors in variables uh, process in some way, um, I'm not uh, uh, convinced. Give me greater confidence that when I'm <laughs> analyzing what's left after that. Uh, that I'm getting the, uh, that I haven't cleaned away the relationship between these variables. Between the two different series. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's my, the source of my hesitancy, that yeah. theoretically it's possible, you know, that, that would occur. But I can tell you um, in one situation where it wouldn't. So I was saying maybe the nature of the effect is that we have that alpha I for the political trust and the alpha I for the, um, health expenditures and the beta I, their counterparts. And it's those two things that are related. If that's the model, you can analyze these things separately because it's not going to mess up your estimates. Where it might mess up your estimates is if the actual repeated measures you know, are influencing each other. 
But yeah. they'd have to be pretty strong relationships, I think, to distort it. And um, when you put the two models together, you may get some signal saying, hey, this isn't right. You know, this isn't. So fitting these separately and getting a good fit is no guarantee that when you merge them together, you'll get a good fit. So there's diagnostics, this chi-square and all this other stuff that I was talking about. There's diagnostics that might say, oh, gee, it looks great as separate series, but now I'm putting it together. And actually, it looks like we've got some serious problem there. So that may lead you to rethink it. Now, you could just try to model both series at once. I just think it's so complicated because I can pretty much guarantee you're not going to get a good fitting model. And then the question is, well, where do I go? from there. You know, think of all the different combinations you could form for these different models I showed you. Right. But each one of those models going with each of those models for the other series, you know, and vice versa. There's just like so many combinations there that I'm just afraid it would be overwhelming. So I probably would take my risk with fitting the series separately and seeing what happens when I put them together. And if the, the fit really deteriorates when I put them together, then I'm suspicious of what I came up with in, in that initial uh, analysis. And then, of course, like we did with the self-reported health, replicating on a, a new data set, you know, that makes a big difference. You feel a little better when you see that that works out. I didn't mention it, but I was on a dissertation committee where uh, a grad student was looking at um, depression in ad health. And to my surprise, she went through the same process we did. And to my surprise, she ended up with that same um, uh, alt model with intercept only. So the same model we had with self-reported health, she, she found with uh, depression. So that made me feel like, well, maybe this is a more general process, you know, that's there. Hmm. I don't want to... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We have another question as well. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, right. It just goes back to science. It's not one study. It's not two study. It's, it's a bunch of studies. So what happens when somebody else tries it? I'd start to worry if they get something totally different. But you know what starts to accumulate? What starts to look like um, a model that does a good description of a large number, you know, of data sets? So there's not if you only have the two data sets, not much you can do about it. And or worse, if you just have one data set, I'm not going to trust any model that I come up with just analyzing one data set. And I, I don't, you know, I was careful to characterize that this was just a subjective feeling that I felt a little better. I could sleep more easily. Not that I found the truth, right? I just felt a little better to see that the same model structure was carrying over uh, to another application. I, uh, yeah. Completely agree with you. But what's better? Let's not even talk about this. Let me just fit this model because I have these other people in my field that are always using a fixed effects model. And the reviewers will probably, you know, criticize me if I don't use this. So I'm going to put this in and I've got a whole bunch of studies I can cite in support of that. Is that a better situation? I don't think so. And that's where we are. You know? Did you have your hand up? No? Okay. okay. Well, um, we have just the one question, which uh, you can think about some more, um, which is uh, if you would uh, want us to share these slides, uh, we can do that, do so. Too. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, super. Um, well, we want to thank Dr. Bowen for an outstanding sure. talk and conversation. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, 
thank you everybody for coming. And we'll, we'll hopefully see, or as I say, uh, Z, uh, many of you again uh, tomorrow for our next event. Uh, that Z is supposed to represent Zoom. Does everybody get that when I say that? I, I don't know. But in it, <laughs> so we will um, we'll see you tomorrow night. And thank you again, Dr. Sure.